Welcome back. In this lecture, I shall introduce vapor compression refrigeration systems. The specific objectives of this particular lesson are to introduce vapor refrigeration cycles, discuss Carnot vapor compression refrigeration system and its practical limitations, analyze standard vapor compression refrigeration system abbreviated as VCRS, compare Carnot system and VCRS. And finally, present performance analysis of VCRS. At the end of the lesson, you should be able to analyze Kano vapor refrigerant system and its practical limitations, analyze standard vapor compression refrigerant system, discuss qualitatively the differences between Kano and vapor compression refrigerant cycles, evaluate the performance of Kano and vapor compression refrigerant system from known data. Let me give a brief introduction. First of all, what is a vapor cycle? In a vapor cycle, the working fluid undergoes phase change at least during one heat transfer process of the cycle. This is again a your gas cycle in which the working fluid does not undergo any phase change. So, in a vapor uh, cycle, whether it is a power cycle or a refrigeration cycle, the working fluid undergoes phase change at least during one process. Okay, that is the definition of vapor cycle. Okay. So, vapor refrigeration cycles can be classified into vapor compression systems vapor absorption systems and vapor jet systems. And uh, among these three, the vapor compression refrigerant systems are the most widely used among all the refrigerant systems in fact. In a vapor compression refrigerant system, refrigeration is obtained as the refrigerant evaporates at low temperatures. The system input is in the form of mechanical energy required to run the compressor. Hence, these systems are also known as mechanical refrigeration systems. Uh, vapor compression refrigeration systems are available to suit almost all applications with refrigeration capacities ranging from few watts to few megawatts. That means, these are one of the most versatile uh, re refrigeration system. First, let us look at uh, Kano vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Let me give a brief introduction to Kano cycle. The Carnot refrigerant cycle is a completely reversible cycle that means it is internally as well as externally reversible. It is used as a model of perfection for a refrigeration cycle operating between a constant temperature heat source and sink. This is uh, one thing you must keep in mind, this is a uh, model of perfection for constant uh, temperature heat source and sink. It is used as reference against which the real cycles are compared. Now, let me explain uh, Kano vapor uh, compression refrigerant cycle. As you can see here, uh, the Kano refrigerant cycle depends, uh, consists of four basic components, the compressor, compressor, condenser, turbine and an evaporator. And the cycle as shown on the TS diagram here consists of four basic processes. Process 1 to 2 is isentropic compression process 2 to 3 is isothermal heat rejection, process 3 to 4 is isentropic expansion in the turbine and finally, process 4 to 1 is isothermal heat extraction. Now, if you look at process 1 to 2, this is nothing but isentropic compression. Okay. So, in this process you can see that the inlet, uh, at the inlet to the compressor you have a mixture of liquid and vapor. That means, at point 1 you have a, a mixture of liquid and vapor. This mixture of liquid and vapor is compressed isentropically from the evaporator pressure P e to the condenser pressure P c. Okay. So, at the exit of the compression process you have saturated vapor at condenser pressure. Okay. So, that is the compression process. Next, the isothermal heat rejection process. During this process, the working fluid rejects heat to the constant temperature heat sink at a temperature of T c, that is a condensing temperature. And during this process, the working fluid undergoes a phase change. At the inlet to the condenser, you have saturated vapor 0.2 and at the exit of the condenser, you have saturated liquid. Okay, so, that is process 2 to 3, which is isothermal heat rejection process. Next process 3 to 4, this is what happens in the turbine. This is an, as I have already said, this is an isentropic expansion process. During this process, saturated liquid, that means that is at point 3 at condenser pressure, expands isentropically in the turbine and at the exit of the turbine, you have a mixture of liquid and vapor at state 4. Okay. And finally, step, uh, process 4 to 1 is, a, is an isoth isothermal heat extraction process. During this process, useful refrigeration effect Q e is obtained. Okay. So, this is the cycle of a simple Carnot vapor compression refrigeration system. 
You can see that in this process uh, heat transfer takes place during process 4 to 1 and during process 2 to 3, whereas work transfer takes place during process 1 to 2 and during process 3 to 4. Now, if you do a simple analysis of the system uh, from first and second laws of thermodynamics, you can write for the cycle, uh, the first and th second laws are, are like this, cyclic integral of uh, dou Q is equal to cyclic integral of dou W and dou Q is nothing but the uh, heat transfer uh, taking place during the cycle, heat transfer take, takes place during process 4 to 1 and this is positive because heat is added to the system and uh, heat transfer also takes place during process 2 to 3 and this is negative because during this process heat is rejected from the system. So, cycling integral of dou Q is nothing but Q 4 to 1 minus Q 2 to 3 and Q 4 to 1 is nothing but useful refrigeration effect Q E and Q 2 Q 2 to 3 is nothing but heat rejected in the condenser Q C. So, cyclic integral of dou Q is nothing but Q E minus Q C. Now, cyclic integral of dou W. So, work transfer takes place during process 3 to 4 and during process 1 to 2. During process 3 to 4, the system does the useful work in the turbine. So, this is positive. Okay. And uh, during process 1 to 2, work is done on the system. So, this is negative. Okay. And uh, if you look at the, the schematic, W3 to, to 4 is nothing but the work output from the turbine WT and W1 to 2 is nothing but work input to the compressor WC. So, cyclic integral of uh, dou W is nothing but WT minus WC which is nothing but minus W net, okay, where W net is the work input to the system. So, um, if you substitute these in this uh, first law for the cycle, you find that Q C minus Q E is equal to W net. Now, what is Q C? Q C is nothing but uh, negative of heat, uh, heat transfer during process 2 to 3. Since this is a reversible process, you can write this as integral T d s from 2 to 3 with a negative sign. And since this is isothermal process, temperature remains constant at condenser temperature. So, T can be taken out. So, integral 2 to 3, uh, integral T d s from 2 to 3 is nothing but T c into S 2 minus S 3. Similarly, Q e that is the refrigeration effect uh, is nothing but the heat transferred uh, during process 4 to 1. It's, uh, again, this is a reversible process. So, you can write this as integral T d s from 4 to 1. Temperature remains constant at evaporator uh, temperature T e. So, integral T d s is equal to T e into S 1 minus S 4. Since processes 1, 1 to 2 and 3 to 4 are isentropic, S1 is equal to S2 and S3 is equal to S4 because the expansion and compression processes are isentropic processes. Now, the COP of the Kano system is given by COP of the Kano is given as refrigeration effect divided by net work input that is QE divided by W net. W net is nothing but QC minus QE, this is QC and this is QE. Okay. And uh, all QE and QC can be written in terms of temperatures and entropy changes that is QE is nothing but T e into S 1 minus S 4. Similarly, QC is equal to T c into S 2 minus S 3. Since uh, S 1 is equal to S 3 and S 3 is equal to S 4, these terms get cancelled. So, finally, you find that the COP of the Carnot cycle is nothing but T e divided by T c minus T e, where T e and T c are evaporator and condenser temperatures. That means, the COP of a Carnot cycle is a function of operating temperatures only. Now, as, as I have already explained, COP of a Carnot cycle is a function of heat source and sink temperatures only. COP is independent of the nature of the working fluid. Whatever be the working fluid, the expression for COP of a Carnot system remains same. Between the same heat source and sink, Carnot COP is the maximum possible COP. That is why I said that this is a used as a standard for uh, comparison. Okay. And COP of all actual cycles will be less than the Carnot COP. And COP of a Kano cycle increases as evaporator temperature increases and as condenser temperature decreases. Let me explain this. Okay, so, you can see here again I uh, am uh, plotting the Kano cycle 1, 2, 3, 4 on uh, temperature uh, entropy coordinates. Okay. So, for a given condenser temperature, that means I am fixing this condenser temperature and let us say that I am increasing T e. So, what happens when you are increasing T e, you find that Q e increases and W net decreases. Okay. And since COP is equal to Q e by W net, as T e increases, Q e increases, that, you, that means the area under 1 to 4 increases and W net decreases, that means the area 1 to 3, 4 reduces. As a result, COP increases as T e increases. And similarly, if you fix T e and reduce, let us say T c. 
So when you are fixing evaporator temperature and reducing the condenser temperature, QE does not change, QE remains constant, but W net reduces. As a result, again COP increases as condenser temperature reduces. The same thing is shown uh, on a graph. Uh, here I have plotted the COP of the Kano system versus uh, evaporator temperature for different condenser temperatures. You can see that for a given condenser temperature as evaporator temperature increases, the COP increases. Similarly, at a given evaporator temperature as the condenser temperature increases, the COP reduces. Okay, that is what we have seen from the expression. And you can also see that uh, the COP increases rapidly with T e, especially for high T c. That means for uh, when the uh, condenser temperature is high, the rate at which COP increases with T e is high. Similarly, COP increases as uh, condenser temperature decreases. However, at low evaporator temperature, that means in this region, the effect of T phi on uh, COP is marginal. So, these are the observations we make from uh, the expression for COP of a Kano cycle. Now, what are the practical difficulties with Kano reference system? We know that the Kano reference uh, system gives the maximum COP. Then what is the problem in having a Kano uh, reference system? There are certain practical difficulties which will prevent us from constructing a cycle which operates on a Kano cycle. Okay. These practical difficulties are like this. The first practical difficulty is with wet compression. I have uh, mentioned uh, while explaining the Kano reference cycle that uh, during the compression process, uh, the working fluid at the inlet to the compressor consists of liquid as well as vapor. That means uh, you have to compress a mixture of liquid and vapor. Most of the practical compressors uh, are designed to compress vapor only. So, if there is a liquid, uh, this kind of a compression known as wet compression. That means whenever you have liquid at the inlet to the compressor, you call that compression process as wet compression. And most of the compressors are not designed for wet compression. So, when there is liquid at the inlet, the compressor may get damaged. Okay. So, this is one of the practical difficulties with Kano refrigeration cycle. Okay. The second uh, difficulty is the extraction of work by expanding saturated liquid in a turbine is not economically justified, especially for smaller systems. <coughs> We have seen that in a Kano refrigeration cycle, uh, the expansion process is isentropic. That means we use a turbine and extract work. That is how you get an isentropic expansion process. But what is the work output during this process? If you assume that the process is steady flow process, then the work output of a turbine, specific work output of a turbine is typically given by if you are neglecting uh, of uh, kinetic and potential uh, energy changes, then you find that work input of a work output of a turbine is given by integral Vdp. And since you are uh, expanding the liquid and liquids have typically very small specific volume. So, you find that this is uh, very small because of the small value of specific volume. As a result, uh, compared to the compressor work input, uh, the work output of the isentropic turbine is very small. Over and above that, when you consider actual turbine, actual turbine will be uh, different from isentropic turbine because there will be some irreversibilities. So, the actual output of uh, a turbine will be much less than the isentropic work output. So, if you consider the um, cost involved in uh, building a turbine and in incorporating a turbine and the work output that you get out of it, uh, you will find that uh, in most of the cases, especially for small capacity systems, it is not economically feasible to use a turbine and to extract work. Okay. So, the economic feasibility prevents the use of turbine. Okay. So, this is the second practical difficulty with a Kano reference system. Okay. Of course, the first difficulty that is uh, the wet compression can be uh, eliminated uh, by using two compressors. Let me show what is the meaning of that. Uh, for example, uh, you can uh, look at the cycle here on T s. Okay, this is T s. Uh, wet compression was something like this. The wet compression can be eliminated if you move this point from uh, this point to the saturated point 1. Okay. Then uh, the wet compression is avoided, but uh, you have to achieve the compression process. Now, you have to add another compressor. Okay. That means, the compression process is split into two parts. Part 1 to 2 is an isentropic compression. Okay, and uh, from uh, evaporator pressure P e to an intermediate pressure P i and uh, process 2 to 3 is isothermal compression from intermediate pressure P i to condenser pressure P c. Okay. So, there by using two compressors instead of one compressor, you can uh, eliminate the problem of uh, wet compression. Okay. 
However, you find that uh, isothermal compression is difficult in practice and uh, have the cost also will go up because you are using two compressors instead of one compressor. Okay. So, these are the practical difficulties with Kano refrigerant systems. Now, let us look at vapor compression refrigerant system which is the system used in practice. This system is a modification over Kano system and what are the modifications? The first modification is that the isothermal heat rejection process in the condenser is replaced by isobaric heat rejection. This is the first uh, uh, deviation from the Kano cycle. Second uh, deviation is that the isentropic expansion of liquid in the turbine is replaced by isenthalpic throttling in a throttling device. Okay, so, these are the two major uh, differences between the vapor standard vapor compression refrigerant system and the Kano vapor compression refrigerant system. Okay. And uh, this uh, standard vapor compression refrigerant system is uh, known as Evans Perkin cycle or sometimes it is also known as reverse Rankine cycle. Now, let me describe uh, the standard saturated single stage cycle. This is abbreviated as SSS. This stands for standard saturated single stage vapor compression reference system. First, let me explain this. Uh, a standard uh, saturated single stage uh, vapor compression reference system, uh, the exit conditions of evaporator and condenser are saturated. That is why you have this uh, term saturated here. And the cycle consists of one low side pressure and one uh, high side pressure. That is why you call it as a single stage uh, cycle. And cycle is internally reversible. And compression is isentropic and expansion is isenthalpic. Okay. So, now let me show the schematic of the cycle and the cycle on TS diagram. You can see here that uh, this cycle also that means the standard vapor compression cycle also consists of four basic components, the compressor, condenser, expansion device or a throttling device and the evaporator. Okay. So, if you compare uh, this cycle with the Carnot cycle, you will find that in terms of the components, the only difference is in the expansion device. There we were using uh, a turbine, here we use a, a throttling valve. Okay. And uh, it, uh, the cycle on TS diagram is shown here, it consists of four processes. Process 1 to 2 is isentropic compression, process 2 to 3 is isobaric heat rejection, process 3 to 4 is isenthalpic expansion and process 4 to 1 is isobaric and isothermal heat extraction. Okay. Uh, now, again if you see if you compare this cycle with the Kano cycle, you find that here the compression is dry compression because you are compressing only vapor. Okay. So, um, uh, the problem of wet compression is eliminated. But as a result of this, so you find that the condensation process or the heat rejection process is isobaric but not isothermal because during the process 2 to 2 dash, the temperature is varying whereas uh, during the process 2 dash to 3, the temperature remains constant. That means, initial heat rejection is uh, an isobaric process but non-isothermal process whereas the rest of the process is isobaric as well as isothermal. Now, coming to the expansion process 3 to 4 is uh, isenthalpic process and this is shown by a dashed line because isenthalpic throttling process is highly irreversible. So, we really do not know the path, we only know the uh, end states 3 and 4. Okay. And process 4 to 1 as I said is isobaric heat extraction and if you are using a pure fluid, this is also isothermal. Okay. So, this is the standard uh, saturated single stage vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Now, uh, how does uh, this cycle compare uh, with the Kano cycle? What are the differences? For the same heat source and sink temperature, that means for the same uh, evaporator and condenser temperatures, compared to Kano cycle, we find that the refrigeration effect of the standard uh, cycle decreases. So, how do you show that? This can be shown with the help of the TS diagram. You can see here that uh, 1, 2 dash, 3, 4 is the Kano cycle, that means this cycle is the Kano cycle. Okay. Whereas, 1, 2, 3, 4, that means this one is your standard uh, vapor compression refrigerant cycle. Okay. Now, what is the refrigeration effect of Kano cycle and what is the refrigeration effect of the standard cycle and what is the difference between these two? Okay. Let us write the expression for this. Now, if you look at uh, 
the Carnot cycle 1, 2, double dash, 3, 4 dash, the refrigeration effect is nothing but the area under uh, the curve 4 dash to 1, that means this entire area, okay, this entire area, right. Whereas the refrigeration effect of the standard cycle is nothing but area under process 4 to 1, that means this area, okay. So, you find that the refrigeration difference between the refrigeration effect of the Carnot cycle and vapor compression difference cycle is nothing but this area 4 dash C D4 that is area A2 and this area A2 is because of the throttling and this area A2 is also known as throttling loss. Okay. So, in terms of uh, you can write derive the expression for this. So, for example, uh, uh, the refrigeration effect of the Carnot cycle as I have already told you is nothing but heat transfer during process 4, to 4 dash to 1. So, that is nothing but integral T d s from 4 dash to 1, temperature remains constant. So, this is nothing but T e into S 1 minus S 4 dash which is equal to area E 1 4 dash C e. Okay. And refrigeration effect of the vapor compression refrigeration cycle is nothing but heat transfer during process Q 4 to 1 that is nothing but integral T d s from 4 to 1 that is equal to T into S 1 minus S 4 that is equal to area E 1 4 D E. So, the difference uh, between the refrigeration effect that is Q E Carnot minus Q E vapor compression refrigeration cycle is nothing but uh, the area D 4 4 dash C D which is equal to H 3 minus H 4 dash or this is also equal to H 4 minus H 4 dash because H 3 is equal to H 4 because this is an isenthalpic uh, expansion process. This is nothing but area A 2 which we call as throttling loss area. Okay. And if you look at the uh, T s diagram, you find that the throttling loss increases as the evaporator temperature decreases and or the condenser temperature increases. And a practical consequence of this is a requirement of higher refrigerant mass flow rate for a given capacity. Okay. Because you are losing refrigeration effect, if the capacity is fixed uh, to get the same capacity, more amount of refrigerant has to circulate. Okay. So, this is the uh, consequence of changing the uh, expansion process from isentropic expansion to isenthalpic expansion process. Okay. Now, let, let us look at the heat rejection. You, you find that for the same heat source and sink temperatures compared to Carnot cycle, the heat rejection increases in a standard uh, vapor compression refrigerant cycle. Again, uh, with the help of the T s diagram, this can be shown very easily. For example, if you look at uh, the T s diagram again 1, 2 dash, 3, 4 dash is your Carnot cycle and 1, 2, 3, 4 is your standard vapor compression refrigerant cycle. And what is the heat rejection in the Carnot cycle? Heat rejection in the Carnot cycle is nothing but heat rejected during process 2 dash to 3 that is nothing but area under 2 dash to 3 which is equal to T c into S 2 dash minus S 3 that means this entire area. Okay. That is area E 2 dash uh, E 2 dash 3 C E. Now, what is the heat rejection in uh, standard vapor compression reference cycle? That is nothing but heat rejected during process 2 to 3, that is nothing but the area under uh, curve 2 to 3, okay. that means this area plus this area. Okay. So, this is equal to area E 2 3 C E, that is area E 2 3 C E. Right, the entire area. So, you find that the difference between the heat rejection of a vapor compression cycle and the Carnot cycle is nothing but this area 2, 2 dash, 2 double dash or area A 1 okay. and this area is known as superheat horn okay. and this is uh, coming because of the fact that we are replacing the isothermal uh, heat rejection of the Carnot cycle by an isobaric heat rejection process. <coughs> now, because of the differences in refrigeration effect and heat rejection uh, rate, you find that the compressor work input increases when you change over from Carnot cycle to standard vapor compression cycle. Again, with the help of uh, T s diagram, we can show this one. If you look at the, again the T s diagram, you find that the uh, net work input of Carnot cycle is nothing but Q c minus Q e of Carnot cycle that is nothing but area 1, 2 double dash, 3, 4 dash 1 that means this area. Okay. Whereas, uh, the uh, net work input of a vapor compression reference cycle is nothing but Q c minus Q e of vapor compression reference cycle that is nothing but this area that means area 1, 2, 3, 4 dash C D 4 okay. that means this area plus this area plus this area. Okay. So, you find that the difference between the net work input of a, car, a standard cycle minus Carnot cycle is nothing but uh, 
uh, this area that means the area rectangular area 1, 2 dash, 3, 4 dash plus uh, superheat horn area A1 plus throttling area A2. Okay. That means the difference is nothing but area A1 plus area A2, okay. this area and this area. right? So, as a result of this, so you find that when you have uh, moved away from the Kano cycle, you lost uh, refrigeration effect and you also have to spend more uh, amount of uh, work input. Uh, okay. So, as a result obviously, the COP of the system decreases. So, you find that the COP of the uh, standard cycle is always less than the COP of the Kano cycle. Uh, okay. For, uh, you can write this expression. For example, COP of the vapor compression different cycle is defined as the refrigeration effect of the vapor compression different cycle divided by the net work input in the vapor compression different cycle. And the QE vapor compression different cycle is written as QE Kano minus throttling area A2 and work uh, input of the standard cycle is given, it can be written as work input to the Kano cycle plus superheat horn area A1 plus uh, throttling area A2. Okay. Now, we can define what is known as the cycle efficiency eta a subscript r, this is defined as the ratio of COP of standard vapor compression cycle to that of Kano COP, right. That means, the cycle efficiency eta r is given by COP of a standard vapor compression different cycle divided by Kano COP. So, that can be shown to be equal to here if you take uh, QE Kano by W Kano as common, then this can be written as 1 minus area A2 divided by QE Kano divided by 1 plus area A1 plus area A2 divided by W net of Kano. You find that this is always less than 1 because area A2 is always greater than 0 and area A1 and area A2 will all also be greater than 0. Okay. So, as a result cycle efficiency will always be less than 1. So, the cycle efficiency sometimes it is also called a second law efficiency. This is a good indication of the deviation of the standard vapor compression different system from Kano cycle. Unlike Kano COP, the cycle efficiency depends very much on the shape of uh, temperature entropy diagram which in turn depends on the nature of the working fluid. We have seen that uh, the COP of a Kano system uh, is a function of the heat source and sink temperatures only and it is independent of the nature of the working fluid. Okay, but you find that uh, the COP of a standard vapor compression different cycle also depends upon the shape of the uh, vapor dome on TS uh, diagram that may which in turn depends upon the nature of the working fluid. Okay. How is it? Let me explain that with the help of the TS diagram. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> as I have already explained to you. Uh, here the uh, standard vapor uh, compression different cycle is given by 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4 okay. and uh, neglecting kinetic and potential energy changes across the compressor, compression process is 1 to 2. Okay. So, if you apply energy balance for the compression process, you find that the work input to the compressor W 1 to 2 of the vapor compression different cycle is nothing but H 2 minus H 1. That means, the enthalpy difference across the compressor, this which is nothing but work of compression. Okay. So, what I do here is I subtract and add H f, where H f is nothing but the saturated liquid enthalpy at evaporated temperature. Okay. So, I am writing H 2 minus H 1 as H 2 minus H f minus H 1 minus H f. Okay. Now, I make one small assumption here. I assume that the saturated liquid line, okay, this is a saturated liquid line, this coincides with the isobar P c. Okay. That means, if I extend the isobar in the liquid uh, region, I assume that this isobar coincides with the saturated liquid line. This is a reasonably good assumption because if you look at the actual T s diagram, you find that the isobars are very close to the saturated liquid lines. Okay. That means, uh, uh, the process uh, 2 to f, f is an isobaric process at uh, pressure P c. Okay. And uh, using the thermodynamic relations T d f is equal to d h minus V d p uh, and if you apply this thermodynamic relation this uh, to the process 2 to f, uh, you will find that this is equal to T d uh, d h because d p is equal to 0 because this is an isobaric process. So, T d s is equal to d h, right, when p is equal to constant. So, what is d h here? d h is nothing but h 2 minus h f, right. So, h 2 minus h f that means this quantity is equal to integral T d s. Okay. Integral T d s is nothing but area under uh, 
uh, the process 2 to f that means this entire area okay this entire area right that is equal to h2 minus hf now what is h1 minus hf h1 minus hf is nothing but area under the curve 1 to f okay 1 to f is an isobaric process so this is nothing but again h1 minus hf is equal to integral tds temperature remains constant so h1 minus hf is nothing but area under curve 1 to f on ts diagram which is equal to this rectangular area okay this rectangular area right so you find that uh, under this assumption uh, h2 minus h1 which is equal to h2 minus hf minus h1 minus hf is nothing but this area okay right so this area is nothing but the rectangular area plus the superheat horn area plus this area a3 okay and uh, in the previous slides we have seen that uh, for a vapor compression reference cycle the net work input uh, is equal to this rectangular area plus this superheat horn area plus the throttling area a2 so if you compare that one with this area which both of them have got to be equal this will show that area a2 is equal to area a3 okay the area a2 is approximately equal to area a3 approximately equal to area a3 because uh, here i am making an assumption that the isobar coincides with the saturated liquid line okay now this area a3 depends very much on the shape of the ts diagram okay <coughs> Now, depending upon the shape of saturated curves on TS diagram, refrigerants can be classified into type 1 refrigerant that means ammonia, carbon dioxide and water, type 2 refrigerant for example, CFC 11, CFC 12, HFC 134A and type 3 refrigerants uh, that is CFC 114, CFC 115, isobutane. Okay, so, let me show these uh, types on TS diagram and what is the meaning of that. You find that type 1 refrigerant has a TS uh, vapor dome like this. You, you can see that the vapor dome is almost symmetrical okay? and uh, the type 1 refrigerants are ammonia, carbon dioxide and water etc. Since the vapor dome is symmetric, you find that the losses due to superheat horn and losses due to throttling both are of the almost same uh, magnitude. That means both are important right? for type 1 uh, refrigerants. Now, type 2 refrigerants that means R11, R12 and R134A, you find that the loss due to superheat horn is much less compared to the loss due to throttling okay, because this area is much less compared to this area. Now, type 3 that means refrigerants uh, high molecular weight refrigerants such as R114 and R115 have a peculiar uh, vapor dome and here you find that there is no superheat horn at all because the slope of the vapor saturated vapor curve is such that when you start compression with a saturated vapor, the exit of the compression lies in the two phase region. Okay. So, there that means there is no superheat horn, that means there is superheat uh, loss due to superheat horn is non-existent for this type of refrigerants, whereas uh, the loss due to throttling is quite considerable. Okay. So, uh, depending upon the type of the refrigerant and depending upon the vapor dome shape on TS diagram, you can classify the refrigerants and what is the use of this classification? You know where you are losing okay. and if you want to do some modifications, you know where you have to concentrate. Okay. Now, let us quickly look at uh, the differences between superheat and throttling losses. I have mentioned that because you have changed over from uh, Kano cycle to vapor compression reference system because of some practical difficulties, uh, two additional losses have been introduced and for the first loss is because of the superheat and the second loss is because of the throttling loss. Now, let us look at these losses. Okay. If you look at the superheat loss, the superheat loss or increases only the work input, it does not affect the refrigeration effect and uh, as I said it does not affect refrigeration effect and in heat pumps superheat is a part of the useful heating effect. That means, if you are using the refrigeration system for uh, heat pumping, uh, that means if you are interested in the heat uh, rejected in the condenser, then you find that the heat loss in the superheat uh, due to superheat horn is not a loss at all because that can be recovered. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the throttling loss, the throttling process is highly irreversible and you find that uh, the, because of the throttling process, the work input increases 
and also the refrigeration effect is reduced. Okay. So, if you look at the expression for COP, the numerator reduces and the denominator increases. Okay. So, you lose on both sides. So, in this respect throttling loss is more serious compared to or it has more significant effect compared to the superheat uh, loss. Okay. Now, let us look at a simple analysis of a standard uh, vapor compression refrigeration cycle and this analysis is carried out under the following assumptions. We assume that the uh, all the processes are taking place in each component is a steady flow process and we neglect the kinetic and potential energy changes across each component and uh, there are no heat transfer or pressure drops in connecting pipelines and the analysis is carried out by applying steady flow energy equation to each component. So, let me show the analysis for each component. First, let us take the evaporator. Remember that the evaporator process is given by process 4 to 1. Okay. So, if you look at the TS diagram. Okay. So, this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So, process 4 to 1. So, at the inlet to the evaporator you have a mixture of liquid and vapor and at the exit of the evaporator you have saturated vapor. Okay. And uh, m dot r is the mass flow rate of the refrigerant and q dot e is the refrigeration capacity of the evaporator. So, if you take the control volume across the evaporator and if you apply the steady flow energy equation, since we are neglecting the kinetic and potential energy changes, you find that the refrigeration capacity q dot e is nothing but mass flow rate of the refrigerant multiplied by the enthalpy difference h 1 minus h 4. Okay. And the pressure uh, at which the evaporator operates is nothing but the saturated pressure corresponding to the evaporator temperature T. Okay. So, if you know the saturation pressure uh, temperature characteristics and if you know the evaporator temperature, you can calculate what is the evaporator pressure. Okay. And uh, you can all, if you know the mass flow rate uh, and enthalpy difference, you can also calculate what is the refrigeration capacity. Now, this parameter H1 minus H4 is known as specific refrigeration effect and the units are kilo joule per kg. Okay. Now, if you apply the steady flow energy equation to the compressor, uh, remember that we are assuming the compression process to be isentropic. So, there is no heat transfer, Q is 0. Okay. Again, we are neglecting delta Ke and delta Pe, both are negligible. Okay. And uh, refrigerant enters at state 1 at evaporator pressure and temperature and it exists at state 2. Uh, which is uh, at a condenser pressure and a, at a discharge temperature T2. Okay. And W dot C is the power input to the compressor. So, if you again apply the steady flow energy equation, you find that the power input to the compressor W dot C is nothing but M dot R into H2 minus H1, where H2 minus H1 is the enthalpy rise across the compressor. And this H2 minus H1 is known as work of compression and it has units kilo joule per kg whereas the power input as you know is in the units of kilowatts. Okay. Similar to evaporator, you can also take uh, control volume across the condenser. Again, uh, there is no work transfer here, W is 0 and delta Ke and delta P are negligible, delta Ke is 0 and delta P is 0. Okay. And Q dot C is a heat rejection rate from the condenser and heat rejection is taking place at a condensing temperature of Tc. Okay. And the condenser pressure P C is nothing but the saturation pressure P sat corresponding to this temperature T C. One thing you must keep in mind is that uh, temperature T 2 is not equal to T C, whereas temperature T 3 is equal to T C. Okay. So, this temperature T 2 is always greater than T C because of the D superheating in the initial portion. Okay. So, you can find out the condenser pressure if you know the saturation uh, pressure temperature characteristics and the heat rejection rate Q dot C can be obtained by this equation. This is from the uh, steady flow energy equation Q dot C is nothing but M dot R into H 2 minus H 3. Now, if you take the expansion device, uh, expansion process is uh, uh, throttling process that means an isenthalpic process and if you take uh, the control volume far downstream of the expansion device then delta Ke will be 0 and delta Pe also will be 0 and there is no work interaction W is 0 and there is no heat interaction Q is 0. So, you find that from steady flow energy equation 
uh, H3 is equal to H4 or this process is isenthalpic process. Now, what is the state of the refrigerant at the inlet of the throttling device? This is saturated liquid, right? Saturated liquid at condenser temperature. Whereas, state 4, if you look at the TS diagram, uh, is a mixture of liquid and vapor, okay? So, this is a mixture of liquid and mixture of liquid plus vapor at condenser temperature at evaporated temperature and pressure. Okay. So, you can write the enthalpy at H4 in terms of the saturated uh, liquid enthalpy at evaporated temperature and saturated uh, vapor enthalpy at evaporated temperature and the quality or dryness fraction X4. Okay. So, H4 is nothing but 1 minus X4 into HFE plus X4 into HGE. This can also be written as HF plus X4 into HFG, where HF is nothing but HFE that is the saturated liquid enthalpy and HFG is nothing but latent heat of vaporization at evaporated temperature. Okay. And uh, H4 is equal to H3. right? So, H3 is known uh, because this is nothing but the saturated uh, liquid enthalpy. So, H4 is also known because H3 is equal to H4 and HFE and HGE are nothing but saturated liquid and vapor enthalpies at evaporated temperature. So, they can be obtained from the properties. So, using this expression, we can find out what is the quality of the refrigerant at the exit of the expansion device. Okay, so, that is the use of this equation. Now, finally, the COP of the SSS cycle is given by Q dot E divided by W dot C. Right. So, Q dot E is nothing but the refrigeration capacity which is equal to M dot R into H1 minus H4 divided by M dot R into H2 minus H1. So, if M dot R get cancelled, so finally you find that COP of the standard uh, saturated cycle is given by H1 minus H4 divided by H2 minus H1, where H1 minus H4 is nothing but your refrigeration effect and this is nothing but your work of compression. Okay. So, finally, COP is expressed in terms of enthalpies only. right? And at any point in cycle, the mass flow rate m dot r can be written in terms of volumetric flow rate v dot, v dot is volumetric flow rate in meter cube per second okay. and v small v is a specific volume in meter cube per kg. Okay. So, V dot divided by V becomes kg per second which is nothing but the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. Now, if you apply this equation to compressor inlet 1, then M dot R is equal to V 1 dot divided by V 1, where V 1 dot is nothing but the compressor displacement rate. That means, V 1 dot is compressor displacement rate. Right. This is again meter cube per second and V 1 is nothing but the specific volume of the refrigerant at the compressor inlet. Okay. Now, what we do is we write the refrigeration capacity which is equal to mass flow rate into H 1 minus H 4 which is nothing but your refrigeration effect right? and the mass flow rate is written in terms of the volumetric flow rate at the compressor inlet V dot 1 and the specific volume of the refrigerant at the compressor inlet V 1. Okay. So, Q dot E is written as v, v dot 1 into H1 minus H4 divided by V1. Now, this parameter H1 minus H4 divided by V1 has the units of kilo joule per meter cube okay. and uh, this parameter is called as volumic refrigeration effect okay. and the units are kilo joule per meter cube. So, what is the um, uh, practical significance of this volumic refrigeration effect? Uh, this is an indication of the size of the compressor. Okay. The higher the volumetric refrigeration effect, smaller will be for a given capacity, higher the volumetric refrigeration effect, smaller will be the required displacement rate of the compressor. Okay. So, this is an important uh, performance parameter. Similarly, the refrigeration effect which has the unit of kilo joule per kg is an indication of the required mass flow rate okay. because uh, for a given capacity, mass flow rate is nothing but Q dot E divided by refrigeration effect. So, higher the refrigeration effect, smaller will be the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. Okay.
Now we have uh, seen that uh, the most of the properties uh, that means most of the performance parameters like refrigeration effect, uh, work of compression, uh, FUOP, volumic refrigeration effect, uh, they are all expressed in terms of enthalpies. So it is really useful to use a pressure enthalpy chart uh, in place of a temperature entropy chart. Okay. Uh, this pH diagram is sometimes known as Mollier diagram. So, this is very widely used in refrigeration uh, cycle analysis because using this cycle you can straight away calculate the required performance parameters. Okay. So, that is what is mentioned here. Since various performance parameters are expressed in terms of enthalpies, it is very convenient to use a pressure enthalpy chart for property evaluation and performance analysis. Using pH charts, one can easily find system performance from known values of evaporator and condenser temperatures. Let me show this pH chart. Okay. So, this is a typical uh, pH chart. Okay. So, here uh, the x axis is enthalpy and y axis is pressure. Okay. Normally, the pressure is drawn on uh, a, log, a log semi log plot. This is drawn on semi log plot so that uh, the at the lower temperatures this plot opens up. Okay. So, generally this is drawn on log scale whereas the enthalpy is on a linear scale. Okay. So, this is normally L n p versus this thing and this is the saturation, uh, this is the vapor dome. Okay. You have the critical uh, point here and from this point to this point is your saturation uh, liquid line. Okay, and from this point to this point is your saturation vapor line. Okay, so, this is your uh, subcooled uh, liquid uh, region okay, and this is your liquid plus vapor two phase region okay, and this is your superheated vapor region. Okay. Now, on the pH diagram, obviously the enthalpy uh, constant enthalpy lines are vertical lines and uh, constant pressure lines are horizontal lines. Okay. And uh, the isotherms, for example, uh, isotherm at uh, uh, evaporated temperature, it is almost vertical in the subcooled liquid region and it becomes horizontal in the two phase region and again uh, it becomes inclined. Okay, and uh, it goes like this and it again becomes almost vertical at low pressure region because the pressure is reducing in this direction. When the pressure is low, you find that the isotherm, shape of the isotherm in the superheated region becomes almost vertical. Why is it so? Because when the pressure becomes uh, very small, uh, the vapor starts behaving as a, an ideal gas. And we know that for an ideal gas, the enthalpy is a function of temperature only. Okay. So, if you are fixing the temperature, enthalpy also gets fixed. Okay. So, if it is a constant uh, temperature line, then it also has got to be constant enthalpy line. As a result, at low pressure region, the isotherm becomes almost vertical. Okay. So, this is isotherm for uh, evaporator uh, temperature and this is the isotherm corresponding to the condenser temperature. Okay. And this is an isentrope, that means this is a constant entropy line. Okay. In fact, you will find that the constant entropy lines will be varying like this, okay. will be varying like this. they will be diverging. Right? And you can also have uh, constant uh, specific volume lines on this constant specific volume lines will be something like this. Okay, if you look at an actual pH diagram, uh, constant specific volume lines and constant entropy lines uh, in the superheated region are also shown in addition to the isotherms in the liquid two phase and superheated regions. Okay. Now, how do we uh, represent the standard uh, vapor compression cycle uh, on uh, pH diagram? We know that for example, if you look at all the four processes beginning with the compression process. During the compression process, uh, saturated vapor is compressed from uh, evaporator pressure to condenser pressure and this process is isentropic process. Okay. So, if you know the this uh, temperature, then you can find out this pressure okay. and uh, you can locate this point. right? And uh, you can also find the entropy at this point. Since the compression process is isentropic, you have to go along the constant isentropic, uh, isentrope, 
right along the constant isentrope and where this constant isentropic line intersects the uh, constant condenser pressure line that is your exit of the compressor okay so you can draw, draw this process right now uh, process 2 to 3 is nothing but a heat rejection in the condenser and this is a, we know that is an isobaric process so all that you have to do is you draw a horizontal line start beginning with point 2 okay and where it intersects the saturated liquid line that is the exit of your uh, condenser okay so process 2 to 3 is nothing but a horizontal line on ph diagram and uh, process 3 to 4 is nothing but isenthalpic throttling process du during this process pressure drops from pc to pe and the enthalpy remains constant so this process is nothing but a vertical line on uh, ph diagram okay and finally the evaporation process uh, the heat extraction process is isobaric so it's a constant uh, it's a horizontal line on ph diagram so the process 4 to 1 is given by this horizontal line okay so finally you find that the vapor compression deflection cycle uh, have, takes this shape 1 2 3 4 okay so you can once you know the condenser pressure and condenser evaporator pressure or condenser temperature and evaporator temperature you can easily uh, locate these points right and you can draw the cycle on ph diagram once you have drawn the cycle on the ph diagram the calculation become very simple for example i want to calculate i want to find out what is the refrigeration effect refrigeration effect as you know re is the refrigeration effect is nothing but h1 minus h4 okay this is nothing but this enthalpy minus this enthalpy or this is nothing but this okay this is your refrigeration effect okay and uh, what is the work of compression work of compression is nothing but h2 minus h1 that is nothing but this enthalpy minus this enthalpy that is nothing but this so this is your work of compression okay so the moment you locate all the points you can straight away read the enthalpy values and you can get the reflection effect and work of compression so cop as you know is nothing but re divided by wc that means this length divided by this length okay so straight away you get the value of cop and you can also find out the required mass flow rate etc if you know the capacity because the mass flow rate is nothing but refrigeration capacity divided by re and re is nothing but this length refrigeration capacity is given so you can find out what is mass flow rate and if you read the specific volume from the ph chart then you can also find out what is the required volumetric displacement at this point okay so like that using the ph diagram you can find uh, find all the required uh, performance parameters okay so that is the reason why we use uh, these ph charts very widely in uh, refrigeration cycle analysis okay so in the next le uh, lectures uh, we'll be using this uh, to evaluate the performance of standard vapor component refrigeration cycles okay and as i've already mentioned this uh, this ph chart is sometimes known as molier diagram okay okay so uh, let me conclude uh, this lesson uh, what is that we have le learned in this lecture in this lesson uh, the kano refrigerant cycle and its practical limitations are discussed the standard vapor compression deflection system is introduced and its working principle is explained and uh, we have compared the vapor compression deflection system with kano system and we have seen what are the deviations and what are the consequences of these deviations and uh, we have presented a simple performance analysis of a standard vapor compression deflection system by applying steady flow energy equation to each component and for, we have also presented uh, the cycle on a ph diagram and i have also explained uh, how to evaluate the required performance parameters using the ph diagrams from the known values of uh, evaporator and condenser temperatures okay the performance of standard vapor compression deflection system and modified vapor compression system will be discussed in next lectures okay thank you Welcome back. Uh, this lecture is a continuation of last lecture wherein we introduced vapor compression refrigeration systems and we discussed saturated single stage standard cycle that is SSS uh, cycle and we compared the performance of that cycle with an ideal uh, Kano vapor compression refrigeration system. And we have also given some uh, basic equations for evaluating the performance of this system. So we will uh, continue in this lecture 
uh, starting with the performance aspects of uh, SSS cycle and we will also discuss uh, the various modifications to the standard cycle. So, the specific objectives of this particular lesson are to discuss the performance of SSS cycle, introduce subcooling and superheating, discuss vapor compression refrigeration system with liquid suction heat exchanger, discuss effect of superheat on system performance, discuss the differences between theoretical and actual cycles and or discuss a complete vapor compression refrigeration system. So, at the end of this lesson uh, you should be able to evaluate the effects of evaporator and condensing temperatures on the performance of a SSS cycle, evaluate the effects of subcooling and superheating using TS and PS diagrams, evaluate the performance of modified vapor compression refrigerant system with liquid suction heat exchanger and find whether superheating increases COP or not using a simple criteria and discuss various irreversibilities in actual systems and their impact on performance. So, let us begin with uh, the performance of SSS cycle. Uh, the performance can be obtained from the simple analysis presented in the last lecture and using suitable property data. And typical performance trend show the effects of evaporator and condenser temperatures. What is normally done is we keep the condenser temperature constant and vary the evaporator temperature and find different performance parameters. Uh, then uh, you keep the evaporator temperature constant and vary the uh, condenser temperature. So, the, in that manner you can find out the effect of both condenser as well as evaporator temperature on different performance parameters of interest. Okay, let me show now uh, the effect of these uh, temperatures on different uh, performance parameters. The first one is uh, the effect of these temperatures on specific and volumic refrigeration effects and then specific and volumic works of compression, then system COP. So, first let me show the effect of uh, the temperature on uh, refrigeration effect. So, this QE is a specific refrigeration effect as you can see it has unit of kilo joule per kg and uh, QV is volumetric uh, volumic refrigeration effect that means uh, refrigeration effect per meter cube of um, uh, refrigerant flow. And you can see here that uh, on x axis I have evaporator temperature. And I have got these performance parameters for different values of condenser temperature. So, you can see that condenser temperature is increasing in this direction for a specific refrigeration effect and it is increasing again in the same direction for volumic uh, refrigeration effect. So, from this uh, graph you can easily see that uh, as you are increasing the evaporator temperature for a given condenser temperature there is a marginal increase in specific refrigeration effect. Okay. And the specific refrigeration effect also or uh, increases as condensing temperature decreases. Okay. That means uh, QE uh, increases as TG increases and TC decreases. But as I said this effect is not very, um, uh, very large, it is marginal that you can easily find out from this uh, PH diagram. As, uh, as I have already discussed in the last class, this is your refrigeration effect or this is your QE. Okay. So, if you are keeping the condenser temperature constant and if you are varying the evaporator temperature, for example, I am increasing the evaporator temperature, that means this line shifts up okay. so, and you have the a new cycle like this. So, what is the increase in uh, refrigeration effect is very, very small. You can see and you can see that it Thank you.